Tonight we're going to be concluding a three-part series called Jehovah, the Names of God. Pastor Tyler uh, gave us the first two, Jehovah Nissi and Jehovah Shalom, and we're going to conclude that series by looking at a third Jehovah name tonight. Now, I have to know this is very important because many of us don't know this. The word Jehovah, it's really a hybrid word. Uh, it's taking uh, the consonants of Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, which is God's divine name as he reveals himself in Exodus chapter 3, Yahweh. Uh, but we're really just guessing at the vowels for that. Really in the Bible, it's just Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. And so what the ancient Hebrew uh, um, scribes did when they came across the divine name of God, it was too beautiful of a name to utter, Yahweh. They had very much, uh, even still Orthodox Jews today, they won't utter the divine name of God. They have much respect towards Yahweh, the divine name of God. So Hebrew scribes, when they would come across the name Yahweh, they would, what they would do is they would take the consonants of Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, and they would marry those consonants with the vowels of Adonai, which means Lord. And so they would take again the consonants Y-H-W-H and marry that with the vowels A-O-A of Adonai, and then it would become a hybrid word that would then be Yahuwah or Jehovah. And so that Jehovah uh, phrase has even entered into some of our modern translations. So again, the word Jehovah, the name Jehovah just stems from God's divine name, Yahweh, from Exodus chapter three, when God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. And the divine name of Yahweh just means I am that I am the self-existent one. That's why when you get to the New Testament, it's like, where did Jesus claim to be God? Well, you see, throughout the Gospels, Jesus used the Greek form, ego a me, meaning I am. And so here again, we're going to conclude this three-part series called Jehovah, the names of God, and I hope that you're encouraged by it. Now, when we kind of talk about the different names of God, we do not mean that God goes by different names in the coexist sense that, oh, we all worship the same God, right? You just call him Zeus, but some others call him uh, Shiva, Vishnu, Brahman. I call him Yahweh, right? We're all worshiping the same God. No, that's not what we mean, but rather we, we worship the one true God, the God of the Bible, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh. But sometimes God reveals himself by his characteristics or by his attributes. So I believe last week, Pastor Tyler went over Jehovah Shalom, meaning uh, my God is peace. He is your peace. And so we can learn a few things about the character and nature of God as we thumb through the scriptures and see how God reveals himself by his different characteristics and attributes. It's kind of like a nickname in a sense. Uh, you guys possibly have different nicknames depending on who you're around, right? And so, you know, for example, you know, with my friends, I, I go by Austin. Uh, to my parents growing up, even still now, they kind of call me Oss or Aussie. It's like a, a little bit of a nickname. Uh, to my wife, I, I go by Snuggle Boo. Um, sometimes Pumpkin Spice. Uh, that, that was gross. We'll move on. Um, so sometimes, just as we kind of go by a nickname, you might have different nicknames depending on who you're around, but you're, you're one and the same person. So we worship the one God, the true God of the Bible, but it's amazing to see how God reveals himself through his attributes and characteristics. And thus, by studying and understanding the different names of God, um, you can learn a few things about who God is. Number one, you can learn about what God is like. Uh, number two, you can learn more about how God operates. And number three, you can learn more about how you can personally enter into fellowship with the Lord and get to know the Lord better. So with that small brief intro, let's pray. And again, let's just ask the Lord now by the Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight because that's, that's why we're here. I hope that's why you're here really just to hear from the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so Lord, we do that now. We come before your throne of grace and we ask that you would just lavish us with your mercy, lavish us with your love and your grace, and now give us understanding as we dive into the pages of your word. God, we love you so much, and we thank you for first loving us. Be our teacher tonight. You're our chief shepherd, so would you shepherd your flock by the pages of your word. Here we are. Here we are, Lord. 
Speak to us, teach us. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people together said, amen. Now, names are important, right? Names are significant. Names carry meaning. Uh, with names, that, there are certain associations with names, right? Uh, sometimes with names, there's a, a positive association with a name. Other, other times, there's kind of a negative association or connotation with a name. That's why, you know, for those of you who are parents in the room, when you had kids and uh, you were picking out baby names, right? You kind of put your baby lists together of, of different names and as husband and wife, you kind of went through each other's babies list and, and certain names on the list you had to cross off. Why? Because that kind of had like a negative association, right? Like we can't name him Billy, that was my ex-boyfriend. Or we can't name her Susan because that was my ex-girlfriend. And, and so we kind of go through the, the, the list of baby names thinking, okay, this name to me carries this connotation or has this association. So we don't have, you know, Benedict Arnold's running through the children's ministry anymore or Adolf Hitler's, obviously, because those names with that name carries a certain connotation with that name. On, on the flip side, um, names can have like this positive association. Some of you are named after your grandpa or your grandma, or maybe it's your middle name. A lot of us have middle names after our parents. Like maybe you, your middle name is, is your dad's name or your dad's middle name. Why? Because they were an important part of your family. They're, they're, they're an important figure in, in your household. And so names can also have this positive connotation. Um, that's why we also get autographs on things, right? You, if you're a baseball fan, you, you have someone autograph your baseball. Why? Because when they sign that baseball, it adds value to that object. Maybe you're, you, you love a certain author, so you, you get them to sign your book. And so we get people to write what their names on certain things. Why? Again, because it, it then carries a certain weight with it, and it adds value to that specific object. So if names are important here on earth with us humans who come and go, then certainly the name of God carries all the more weight and value to it. I'm just going to run through a few different scripture passages with us. In the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, it says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Why? Because God's name is holy. And so sometimes, um, some of us throw out just uh, frivolously, uh, OMG, like, oh my God, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. That's taking the name of the Lord in vain. And Exodus 27, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, because God's name is to be revered and respected and and it's, it's holy. And Jesus would say in Matthew 6, 9, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now that word hallowed, it's kind of a Bible Christian word, but it just means holy. God's name is holy. What does the word holy mean? Well, the word holy in the Hebrew, it means to be unique. It's distinct. There's nothing like it. It's kind of like the sun in our solar system. There's nothing like it. It's unique. It's holy in that sense. Well, God's name is to be hallowed. It's, it's, it's holy. It's to be revered. Proverbs 18.10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. With the name of the Lord, there is refuge and there is strength. Psalm 8.1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So we see from scripture that God's name is holy. God's name is to be revered, respected. There is strength and majesty with the name of God. And so one of the best ways to get to know God intimately and personally is to study God's names in Scripture. And the final name that we'll look at tonight is his name, Jehovah Rapha. Can everybody say Rapha? Jehovah or Yahweh Rapha. It means the Lord that heals. It's a beautiful name. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. And the word, again, Yahweh, comes from Exodus chapter 3, the divine name, the I am, or the self-existent one. But the Hebrew word Rapha means to heal. And so we're going to see this name here in Exodus chapter 15, the Lord that heals. So let's dive into our passage now, and let's, let's learn more together about who the Lord is, how he operates, and how we can know him better. Starting in verse 22, Exodus 15 Verse 22. 
It says, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. It sounds like the good, a good name of a wilderness. Hey, what, where should we go? Let's go to the wilderness of Shur. Shur, it sounds good to me. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Verse 23 says, now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Verse 25, so he cried out to the Lord, that is Moses, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. Pause there with me. Have you ever been to the ocean and maybe you've been swimming or uh, um, skimboarding, trying to surf, and you just ate it, like a huge wave just came over you, and then you got that sudden, just overwhelming taste of ocean salt water in your mouth, and then you're walking out of the ocean, coughing up that salt water, trying to get that bitter taste out of your mouth, all right? If you can just quickly capture that taste, hold it on to the tips of your tongue, because this is kind of what this text involves here. So let's unpack this together. Look back at verse 22. It says, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. All right, so just again, some context. Maybe you were here on Sunday and you kind of already got the context here because on Sunday we were in Exodus 33, kind of talking about the same group of people. Well, here we're a little bit earlier in Exodus 15. What's happened is God has just raised Moses up as the deliverer of the Hebrew people. Moses goes back into the land of Egypt to free his people, the Israelites. They were slaves in the land of Egypt for 400 years. Moses is now the new deliverer of the people. Through the power of God, Moses being their deliverer, God shows his miraculous works and power, sends 12 plagues upon the Egyptians. Pharaoh's heart is finally softened to the point where he lets the Hebrews go. Reluctantly, all right, he changes his mind, chases after them, right? But then what does God do? God parts the Red Sea so that the Hebrews cross the Red Sea on dry ground. And the Egyptians are swallowed up by the Red Sea. Finally, the Hebrew people are free. No longer slaves in Egypt. But the Bible then says here in Exodus 15, okay, Exodus 14 was the Red Sea crossing. Exodus 15, now the Bible says they've been walking for three days in the wilderness without water. Can you imagine walking in the desert for three days how thirsty you would be, all right? Medically, scientists say that your body can go no longer than three days without liquid. And so imagine they are at the point of exhaustion, coming to then, the Bible says, the springs of Mara. Oh, they sound just so beautiful, right? The springs of Mara, it sounds amazing. Now again, can you imagine crossing the Red Sea, walking through the wilderness for three days, no water in sight, none. And they begin to complain to Moses. But then they see these springs. Oh my goodness, can you imagine the excitement? Possibly falling down upon the waters of Mara, placing their faces in the water, lapping it up like a dog, only then to have the bitter taste of ocean water in your mouth. That's what the Bible says. We just read it a moment ago. Now, Bible scholars believe that the reason these waters were bitter was because the water was brackish. Now, brackish water is a mixture of fresh water and salt water. So not as salty as the ocean, but certainly not fresh enough to drink. So the water was brackish. And the place that they come upon is called Mara. Literally, Mara in the Hebrew means bitter. And the Bible then again says that they start to complain. Look at verse 
um, 23. Now, when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained against Moses. That's what the Israelites did best. It's what we do best. We complain. They complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So Moses cried out to the Lord. I think sometimes we overcomplicate the Christian life. We run into trouble. What does Moses do? He cries out to the Lord. When we're faced with difficulty or challenges, we panic. Cry out to the Lord. The book of Acts says that God is nearer to you than you think. And so what does Moses do as the amazing leader of probably a million plus Israelites? Does he stand tall and proud? saying, I'm gonna take care of you guys. No, he humbles himself. The Bible says he cries out to the Lord. It's encouraging to us. Verse 25, so he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. Now when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. All right, pause there with me. So again, the people complain. Moses cries out to the Lord. The Lord shows Moses a tree. Um, some translations just say wood. Um, the ESV uses the word log. So most likely this is a tree branch. God shows Moses a tree branch. Moses tosses the piece of wood into the water and the waters go from mara, bitter, to the Bible says sweet. It's the Hebrew word mathak. So the waters go from mara to mathak, from bitter to sweet. Now we don't typically think of water as something that's sweet, right? You know, nowadays we got to flavor our water. You know, we can't just drink plain water nowadays, you know? We got to have a few, what are those things called? Uh, like Mio squirts, you know? Got to have a few like Mio sport squirts in our water, maybe a, some, some electrolyte powder flavor that water up, you know? And it's, it's a little bit more pleasant to drink because we, we just, for whatever reason, this next generation, they just can't drink good plain water. My kids, my girls at home, like you need to drink water. They always want juice. They always want sugar. They always want electrolyte powder. Like, no, drink old-fashioned colonial day water, <laughs> like from the earth. It's great. It's amazing. And so we don't typically think of water as sweet, but the Hebrew word mathak just means it was pleasant. It was thirst quenching. It was so good to drink. So God changed the waters from Mara to mathak. Now, what's super interesting here is that God has Moses throw a tree branch into the water. Now there wasn't magical, nothing magical about this tree branch. All right, it's not like Harry Potter's wand. All right, he's casting spells over the water. Nothing witchcraft going on here. This is God just supernaturally using a tree stump to heal the waters. Um, this is very encouraging, all right? Because if, if God can use a tree branch, God can use you and me, right? God can use us. This is so encouraging. Moses cries out, to the Lord in a difficult situation. God is gracious and he uses a tree branch to heal the waters, to feed the million plus Israelites. If the Lord can use a tree branch, he can use you and me. But what's so encouraging and amazing about this is uh, Jesus is a carpenter, so he loves to use wood. And in Exodus chapter, uh, was it 17? Tyler went over this, I think last, uh, two weeks ago maybe. Um, Moses held up a rod over his head and God used that rod over his head to defeat the Amalekites. Um, in um, Exodus, what is it? Exodus 14, the parting of the Red Sea. God used that same staff, that piece of wood in Moses' hand to part the Red Sea. Then we get here to Exodus 15. God uses a random tree branch to heal the waters. And what this is divinely pointing to is that God in human flesh would come and hang on a tree, not just to provide healing for this body of water to provide thirsty people with drink, but God in human flesh would hang on a tree and he would bring healing to the deeper issue of our sin. And so Jesus as that divine carpenter I find it fascinating that he loves to use wood to accomplish his divine purposes. 
And again, so here in Exodus 15, God heals, so to speak, the waters and changes them from Mara, bitter, to Mathok, something that is sweet. And the people are blessed and God provides for them. And then here in the latter half of 25, it says there, then there he made a statute. All right, it says that God made a statute with the people and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. Now, this is really easy for us just to gloss over, but I want to just kind of park it here on a quick side note, because I think this is an important principle for us to understand, that God tested his people. Now, does, does God test us? This is important for us to understand. God does not tempt us. The Bible is clear on that, but God does allow his people to be tested, and he tests his people often through trials. Now, is every trial or is every difficulty a test from the Lord? No, not every trial or challenging situation that we face is God testing us. Sometimes we can be hypersensitive and think that God is always testing us or God is out to get us, okay? God's not out to get us. We're his people, we're his kids, but he does sometimes use trials to teach us and to test us, and there's a difference. Again, God doesn't tempt us, but he does sometimes allow us to be tested, and here's a time where he allows his people to be tested, why? So that his people grow and mature and learn to lean in and depend on the Lord to a, de- to a greater degree than you would have without the trial and without the testing. And here's a place where God tests his people and he allows us sometimes to be tested, again, so that our faith grows. Why? So that So that God learns more about our faith? No, God already knows all about us, but more so he allows the trials and the difficulties in our lives to mature our faith so that we come to a greater understanding and realization of the substance of our faith. God already knows how weak we are, how strong we are. But sometimes again, God allows us to go through difficulty for our faith to be tested so that we learn the substance of our faith so that we can grow and mature in that area. And so that others around us might be encouraged as well. And this is important for us to understand that sometimes trials reveal the substance of our faith. Spurgeon put it this way, that faith is as vital to salvation as the heart is to the body. Faith is as vital to salvation as the heart is to the body. The heart being this vital organ that keeps our physical body moving. I don't know how many of you are runners. Um, Clearly it's not my strongest suit. Um, But for those of you who are runners and you know what it feels like to go on a long run, what begins to happen is there's this kind of like, um, what I kind of call like a, um, it hurts so good kind of a feeling, you know? It's like this, this, this pain that's entering the body, but it's this good kind of a pain because you know the body is stretching itself, why? So that it can go further and endure a longer run. And so if you've gone on, like for me, it'd probably be like a mile. My heart would be like burning, but it'd be this like burning sensation that was this good burning. Why? Because again, it allows you then the next time to run further and to go longer and to go faster. And so then you get to the point where five miles is a breeze, 10 miles is a breeze. Why? Because you have put your heart under this amount of stress. It's a good stress. Why? Because it grows the muscle. And the muscle is pushed and the muscle is challenged so that it matures and that it grows and it becomes stronger. And James would put it this way in in the book of James, James chapter 1. In James 1, 3, he says, my brothers, my sisters, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. For the testing of your faith produces patience. Other translations say perseverance so that your patience matures and grows, so that you lack nothing and can can be complete. 
Now, the testing of your faith produces patience. The word patience in the book of James, it's a Greek word, two Greek words combined, hupo, meno. Hupo meaning under and meno meaning to abide in or remain in. So the word patience in the book of James where he says the testing of your faith produces patience. It produces hupomeno, meaning to remain under. A lot of the time, we love to come out from under difficulty. Whenever we're faced with trials or challenges or difficulties, we like to escape it. We run from it. We say, God, please relieve me from this pain. I don't think that's a bad prayer. Because sometimes God is gracious and he, he relieves us of that pain, that trial, that difficulty. But sometimes God wants to show himself strong in the midst of it. And so the only way that he is able to show himself strong in the midst of it is if we remain under it. And the testing of our faith produces hupomeno, where we're not asking God to remove the trial from us, but we're saying, God, as I remain under it, Lord, strengthen me and mature me and grow me. Why? So that I can be stronger for the next difficulty that I will inevitably face. And so that I can encourage the next person who grows through, goes through a similar difficulty. It's a hard thing for the Christian to grasp that sometimes God allows us to remain under difficulty. Why? Because he wants to show you just how strong he is in the midst of it. And God will never be able to show his name, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, unless you first experience the weight of remaining under a trial where then your faith is tested and you are matured, James says, and you can become complete, lacking nothing. I'll be the first to say, I'm, I, I wanna escape every little difficulty. It's cold outside. Lord, please get me into 80 degree weather. Please, Lord, this is difficult. I don't wanna go through this. And I complain. And we are no different than the Israelite people who just complain when we're faced with difficulties. But here is a place again where God tested his people, why? Not so that he could learn more about them, but so that they could learn more about themselves, understanding they needed to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and depend on him and rely on him. Why, because this is gonna be a long journey. And God, I'm gonna need you to strengthen me in the midst of this. And so again, is every difficulty a test from the Lord? No. But sometimes in the midst of our difficulty, we need to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, what are you trying to teach me in the midst of it so that you can mature me and grow me so that I can lean on you and depend on you? And God, in the midst of that difficulty, will bring you to greater depths of his love, his grace, his mercy, his person. He will bring you to depths of intimacy that you would have never experienced unless God had allowed you to remain under that problem. Don't resist it. Don't fight it. Allow the Lord by his Holy Spirit to do that amazing work in your life as you remain in it and God strengthens you through it. And so here then in verse 25 where it says, there he made a statute and an ordinance for them and there he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians. Here's our theme, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now, in our English Bibles, that's a long phrase. What is that? Eight words, for I am the Lord who heals you. In the Hebrew Bible, two words, Yahweh, Rapha. Yahweh, Rapha. And they're at a place now where they learn more about who the Lord is along their journey. God is revealing himself in a unique way to his people saying, just so you know, along this journey, which turns out to be 40 years, and not very many of them make it, God is revealing to his people, listen, if you press into me, if you lean into me, if you trust me, if you cling to me, I will reveal myself to you as the Lord who heals, Yahweh Rapha. Here's where I wanna bring it home in the last 10 minutes of our Bible study, listen. Some application here. The Lord still loves to be called by this name, Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals. 
God is still in the business of healing. And yes, the Lord can supernaturally heal physically. I totally believe that. Does he heal everybody? No, he doesn't. But I don't just necessarily mean the Lord who heals physically, but the Lord loves to be known by this name in so many areas of our lives, Yahweh Rapha. The Lord is still in the business of healing broken relationships. God is still in the business of healing broken marriages. God is still in the business of healing broken friendships. God is still in the business of healing broken family bonds where there has been tension between you and your parents, you and your children, you and your siblings for a long, long time that when you release your bitterness, so to speak, when you surrender your attitude, your thoughts, when you surrender your life to the Lord and say, Lord, you know that I, I, I have no control over this situation, over this broken relationship, but Lord, I'm clinging to this name, Yahweh Rapha, trusting that as I invite you into the mess of this situation, that by your spirit, you can go to work and you can still bring healing to my situation. And within the context of our Bible study tonight, the Lord turned bitter waters into sweet waters. And that's what he does. That's what he did here, literally turning bitter waters into something sweet. But also, figuratively speaking, the Lord can heal bitterness. And this is where I'm going to kind of park it for the remainder of our Bible study. Bitterness is like a poison that wells up in our lives unless dealt with by the power of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, because we have been hurt, we have been offended, maybe something from our childhood that continues to replay in our minds because of the pain, because of the hurt. And what happens is, if we don't give that over to the Lord, the enemy loves to take advantage of that hurt, that anger, and he turns it into bitterness. And we continually go back to that well of bitterness, and we drink from the waters of Mara hoping that it finally resolves our situation, hoping that it finally produces that vengeance on that person who hurt us. And what we need to do is we need to give that over to the Lord, easier said than done, and go to the secret place with the Lord and say, Lord, I pray that you would remove the bitter waters from my heart. And just as you turned the Mara into Mathak, bitter into sweet, Lord, would you take the bitterness of my own heart and would you turn this into something sweet? The Bible elsewhere says that God turns ashes into something that's beautiful. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 61, maybe I'll read it in just a moment, it says that God turns uh, beauty from ashes. God can also turn something bitter and he can make it sweet and he can reconcile relationships and he can make your marriage sweet again and he can take the familial hurt and he can turn it into something that is sweet again, where there's good fellowship and there's intimate love and tenderness and conversation. And I just wanna encourage maybe one, uh, one, one person in this room, I don't know, maybe two or three. I wanna encourage you to trust God again with that relationship. And God can help you. And God still loves to be called Yahweh Rapha, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Um, when you go to the doctor and you get a prescription, they give you an RX. RX in the Latin means to take or a prescription. I'm gonna just quickly, in our next five minutes, I'm gonna highlight three prescriptions for bitterness in our lives. Number one, the RX for bitterness is ask God to soften your heart towards the person that's hurt you. This is the very first prescriptive instruction I believe that God asks of us to take, where he asks us first to pray, to get alone with him and say, God, would you soften my heart towards the person that has hurt me? Why? Because what happens is our hearts become hard towards people, towards people that have hurt us, offended us, angered us, our hearts become hard. The natural tendency of our humanness is to default to becoming calloused 
and hard and bitter towards the people that have hurt and offended us. And you might say, I don't want to have a soft heart towards this person. You don't know what they've done to me. You don't know how they've offended me. And you're right, I don't. And again, it's easy for me to sit up here and say, just to pray, ask the Lord to soften your heart. It's easy to say that, much harder to do. But when you get alone with the Lord and you're calling upon Yahweh Rapha and saying, God, I need you to heal this situation. But first, you need to soften my heart for this person and just say, God, would you give me a compassion for for this person? Give me a compassion for this person because I don't like this person. They've offended me, they've hurt me, or they've hurt someone I love dearly. You need, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to soften my heart towards this person. And you pray for that person. And when you pray for that person, God will begin to soften your heart and give you a compassion and a love for that person that you haven't had before. But it starts when you get alone with the Lord and you desperately seek the Lord and pray. Say, God, you need to soften my heart. Bitterness does nothing to reconcile the issue. It doesn't resolve the problem. It doesn't bring peace. It it doesn't, um, the Lord by his Holy Spirit brings a balm and a salve to your mind. Uh, He brings a healing, and I'm speaking spiritually, of course. He brings a healing spiritual balm to your mind. And when you ask the Lord to bathe and dress your mind with the healing balm of the oil of the Holy Spirit, he does that work and he softens your thoughts towards that person. He softens your heart towards that person. And I'm not trying to get all hyper-spiritual or mystical in any way. I'm speaking figuratively, spiritually. The Holy Spirit pours himself upon you and he softens your heart towards that person. And sometimes we think that if we harbor bitterness or anger towards that person, that it resolves the issue and it doesn't. It's a bad prescription. It's a bad medicine. So you first got to ask, Lord, would you soften my heart towards this person? Number two, forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Again, I feel like somewhat of a uh, phony just putting out these prescriptions as if I'm some spiritual doctor. Right? This, these are things the Lord has had to work in my own life and in my own heart. But we have to learn to forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Why? Because comparatively, God has forgiven us of so much. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, he has washed over our sin and covered us with the blood of Jesus Christ if we've repented and trusted in him. And he has forgiven us of so much. So why do we withhold forgiveness to someone who has offended us comparatively with so little? God has forgiven us so much in Jesus Christ. And if you don't think that God has forgiven you so, of so much, you don't fully understand and grasp God's grace and forgiveness. But when you realize that God has forgiven me of so much dirt and filth and offense, it will then help you to forgive the person that has hurt and offended you. C.S. Lewis would say, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Jesus would talk about forgiveness all throughout the Gospels. Go back and read Matthew chapter 6 where he says in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we also forgive those who trespass against us. And so God wants us to reflect Christ in this way by forgiving those who have hurt and offended us. And then finally, number three, let God's healing power go to work by his Holy Spirit. Allow God to show you more of himself, specifically his name, Yahweh Rapha. As you then just let God, then just take the reins and just go to work by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's like when you, you, when you take an aspirin for a headache, to a certain degree, you're just trusting the medication to take over. All right, I pop an aspirin, I've got a headache, I'm going to trust that the medication will relieve me of my headache. You go to a doctor, say, doctor, to some degree... As you put me under, I'm in your hands. I'm trusting you just to take over and to mend what is broken. What is super interesting about that uh, word Rafa, it doesn't just mean to heal, but it means to mend or to knit back together as a surgeon would. And what you are inevitably doing is you are going to the great physician saying, Lord, stitch back together my life, my heart, my brokenness, my marriage, my relationships, and again, place your healing balm over my heart and just go to work. I'm just trusting you because I, 
I don't trust myself. I don't trust my flesh. And so, God, I'm submitting and surrendering to you in the power of your Holy Spirit. Jesus would quote Isaiah 61 in Luke chapter, I think it's Luke chapter 4. And he would say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus again would say in John 7, 37, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, remember the Israelites needed their thirst quenched. Well, Jesus is the personification of this. And he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. And so let's, in closing tonight, let's just go to the Lord now and And I'm not going to ask for anybody to come forward or to raise hands. You know who you are. And and let's go to the Lord. And some of you tonight, you just need to release things over to the Lord tonight. I imagine in a room this large that many of us have experienced hurt or brokenness. And tonight is the night where you release that to Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals And you say, God, I can't do this on my own, but I I need you by the power of your spirit, again, just to pour out your healing balm upon my heart. Lord, would you do that now in our lives? For those of us in this room who are holding on to bitterness, Lord, just as you healed the waters in Exodus 15, and you turn bitter waters into something sweet. Lord, would you do that in our hearts? Would you change the bitter waters of our hearts and would you turn them into something sweet, Lord? Broken marriages in this room tonight, heal them in the name of Jesus, Yahweh Rapha. Broken relationships, broken hearts, heal now according to your spirit in the name of Jesus. Yahweh Rapha, would you go to work in our lives and heal us? Heal us of brokenness. Help us to surrender that to you. Help us to forgive as Christ has first forgiven us. Lord, we just now release these things into your hand, and we trust you now to go to work in our hearts. Here we are. Pour out your spirit upon us. We thank you that you still love to be called Yahweh Rapha. You're still in the business of healing. Pray for those who are going through physical health issues. Lord, I pray that you would touch their bodies in the name of Jesus. Would you heal them? And if not, would you help us to endure so that our faith might grow and mature? We love you, God. We praise you. We give you all the glory for what you're doing in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.